When we talked about sound waves, we touched on the idea that those waves can interact with each other and cause interference. And the thing is, this is true for any type of wave. We have discussed light as a wave. In this section, we are going to mostly cover visible light because, well, that's what we can see, and it does some really cool stuff. Visible light is a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, so it does follow that it travels at the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and it is given the designation of little c. It also follows the equation for the speed of light, in which that little c is equal to the frequency times the wavelength of the light. Remember that light is a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, with wavelengths between 380 nanometers and 760 nanometers. We also found that when light travels through different mediums, the wavelength can change, but the frequency remains the same. So the wavelength of light in a specific medium is determined by its wavelength in a vacuum, divided by the index of refraction of that particular medium. Since the color of light depends on frequency, color does not change when going through a different medium. When discussing the patterns associated with light waves, we have to start with light that is monochromatic. Literally, mono means one and chromatic means color, so we're talking about the light that is emitted as one color. To make this a little more measurable, we can be more specific and say that it is light emitted at a specific frequency. This is fairly easy to manipulate if we have one light source, but we also want to consider if we have more than one source. In that case, we want that light to be coherent. This happens when the sources are doing the same thing at the same time. If we look back at how waves travel, we know that at some source there is an emission of waves at some frequency. This could be our light source, it could be a pebble thrown into the water, a tuning fork. It doesn't matter, the same wave patterns will emerge. Waves move out in all directions at some velocity perpendicular to the source. We can identify the parts of the wave and say that the colored sections are the crests of the waves, which would make the dark sections the troughs of the waves. We can also measure the distance covered by one entire wave and call it the wavelength. What if we have a second light source? This would be an example of coherent light. You have two light sources emitting the same wavelength of light, and it occurs so that the crest of each wave is emitted at the same time. The waves are still traveling out at some velocity from each source, but since the sources are so close together, the waves run into each other to form what we call a supercrest by constructive interference. As the waves move out, they continue to interact, forming another supercrest, and another. If we look at all those supercrests, we will see that they form a line out from the sources. If we were to measure the distance from each source, we would find that they are exactly the same distance from each source. These supercrests formed from constructive interference are going to form areas where the light is really bright. If this were a water wave, the crests would meet and you would have a much larger crest and a higher intensity of water hitting you. The same thing happens with light, where the intensity of the light will increase where the crests meet. Now there are also going to be places where the crest of a wave from one source meets the trough of the wave from a second source. This is destructive interference and forms an area where the light essentially cancels out. There's no wave here. Think about a water wave. If a crest meets a trough, then the water just levels out to the original water level before the wave started moving through it. Keep moving out from the sources and we will find that there are more areas of destructive interference. This line of destructive interference gives us a line of no light. We can project this light pattern onto a screen and what we see is an area of bright light along the line of constructive interference and areas of no light along the lines of destructive interference. If we were to do this all the way around, we would see alternating patterns of light and no light. This is what we refer to as a diffraction pattern. To better understand what is happening, we can look at the transverse waves from different viewpoints. Look down from above. We can see the wave crests alternating with the wave troughs. A good visualization of this would be looking down on the ocean and seeing the tops of the waves. Looking directly from the side, we see more of a graph of the wave and how much it is displaced in crests and troughs from its original position. Overall, what we see is a three-dimensional picture of the medium as a wave moves through it. So we've looked at how the waves interact as they move out spherically from their sources. We now want to look at what happens when the front of the wave hits a barrier. Hens was a Dutch scientist who developed the idea that every point on a wave front was a source of spherical waves at all times. So each point along the wave front is creating a new spherical wave front. So as the wave approaches the barrier, the part of the wave on either side is simply blocked by the barrier. When this happens, we can observe a new spherical pattern emerging on the other side of the barrier. 
This is fairly obvious with sound waves. If you've ever stood outside a door and listened to someone inside, you know that you do not need to be in the direct line of sound waves to be able to hear them. Now light is a little bit different in that it does not bend around and fill the entire room. However, if you are sitting in a dark room connected to a lit room, you will see that there is not a sharp shadow, but more of a fuzzy one. This indicates that the light does behave in a similar manner. We can make the opening smaller and the spherical pattern becomes more pronounced. This helps us explain the difference between the sound and light waves around the corners. Because light rays have such a small wavelength, they tend to act more like a ray, so the large openings of a door do not affect them as much as the sound waves. But as we make the opening smaller, we can observe the bending of the light waves. So overall we know that visible light has wave characteristics and obeys the rules of electromagnetic radiation. Those light waves are going to interfere with each other constructively to form higher intensities of light. These are going to be reflected as bright spots on a screen. Light waves can also interfere with each other destructively to form low intensities or dark spots on a screen. We also know that light waves are going to bend around different barriers.